My name is John Fetterwoman. <laughs> My name is Dave Rubin. This is the Rubin Report. It's September 13th, 2022. We're live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and Blaze TV. Subscribe, tap the notification bell, etc. And that cold open we just showed you there, if you're not paying attention to national politics, I don't think we've done anything on the Pennsylvania Senate race, but that is John Fetterman slash Fetterwoman, because pandering no, no, knows no bounds with these people. Uh, who is running against uh, newly minted Republican, let's say, uh, Dr. Oz, uh, TV host Dr. Oz. And Fetterman, this guy, has just been an abject disaster at every possible level. We're going to get to him in a little bit because I'm going to sort of lay out the case that a series of people that are put into positions of power, either politically or in the media, get everything wrong, and then they always fail up. I call this Gavin Newsom syndrome. If you do everything wrong in your career, if everything that you touch turns to poop and you keep getting better jobs, uh, that is a sort of Democrat privilege, which as I often say, is the only privilege really in America. Uh, so the Democrats, that's what they do. They fail up and it doesn't matter if it's just politicians, it's also media people, it's the analysts, it's the journalists. It's the entire thing. Uh, but I think it's time for us to realize, especially uh, post-COVID, although they still think we're in COVID, uh, that all the people who got everything wrong, we can't just kind of be like, okay, we should pay attention to you again. We got to start figuring out a better way to deal with these people. But before we get to any of that, Joe Biden yesterday, he gave a couple speeches. There were so many gaffes, so many slurred words, so much complete nonsense, so much reading off a teleprompter, having no idea what he was saying, that we had like 10 of these clips that we were going to show you this morning and just go one after the other, just to start the show off on a, on a Biden gaff uh, machine. However, I thought right before we started, I said, guys, it's a little gratuitous. Can we just do one? Let's just pick the best one. Uh, so here's Joe Biden telling a bunch, a bunch of cancer patients not to jump off a ledge. And I want to thank all of you, the cancer patients, survivors, caregivers, and don't jump from up there, okay? I, what, what? Nothing like telling a bunch of uh, cancer patients and survivors not to jump from the high ledge that they're, good God, help us all. Okay, so let's get to it. So I wanted to start with this clip of Bill Maher, and you guys know my feelings about Bill Maher. I don't have to belabor them. I am going to Los Angeles on the 21st of this month. That's like a week from today or something like that to sit down and do Bill Maher's uh, Club Random podcast. It's a two-hour uncensored conversation with him. I hope I'm going to be able to bring up all the stuff I'm always talking about here. And as you know, when I criticize the guy, I try to do it respectfully. I think he is the last sane liberal, and really that kind of makes you a conservative at this point. Anyway, he's got a, uh, a new podcast that he's doing from his home, and they do it while he's either smoking weed or drinking booze. I've told them the tequila that I want during this thing, so we'll get liquored up and see what happens. Anyway, he had Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers on the show this week, and Aaron Rodgers has become one of the most outspoken anti-COVID mandate and lockdown uh, athletes, regardless of sport, acro across the, the sport spectrum. Uh, so Rogers went on the podcast and they started talking about COVID policies and vaccines and who did what and when they did it. And well, you tell me if some of this stuff makes sense. To me, the, the frightening thing was never the disease itself. The frightening thing was how much you could, you could get people so quickly to change their way of life. Stay home, wear a mask, you know, don't touch. That was altruistic at first. It's like, all right, yeah. yeah we'll take... of and then just about well, uh, every conspiracy theory came true. Vaccine mandates, vaccine passports. Right. And it turned into like a way from doing your job to stop the, the spread to like lockdowns. And that's my whole problem, you know, I grew up in a small town, with very little cases up in Chico, California, but all the small businesses fucking gone. 
I mean, our favorite restaurants in LA and New York and across the country, not just in big cities, but some crazy percentage will never open again. Why? Absolutely. And then what are we doing for them? What are we doing for the well, small businesses? There was some PPE loans and, and stuff that people could file for. Well, we did. We passed out $6 trillion. And the, the sad fact about that is that a very big, big, big chunk of it was just flat out stolen. Yeah. I mean, we spent more to keep people hiding under the bed than we did for World War II. World War II cost $4 trillion, and we passed out almost $6 trillion for this. I mean... Wow, talk about a country that's gone a little soft. Okay, so the reason I wanted to show you that clip is because this is where I'm gonna really try to push Bill. It's like, he gets it. It does not work when the government comes in and shuts you down and tells you if you can go to school or can go to work or should be injected or all of those things and then gives you money back. And again, the government is never giving you money. It's taking money from some people and giving it to other people. It's not the government's money, it's your money, right? He gets that that doesn't even work. The giant bureaucracy, all of the stuff doesn't work. But what I really wanted to focus on in this clip, uh, because it gets to the theme of everything else I want to do today, is, is the beginning of that, where he talks about how the frightening thing to him wasn't the disease, it was all of the other things, how quickly people would give up their freedoms in two weeks to flatten the curve and social distancing and all of those other things. Now, I've discussed this many times, and since all of my videos are still online, at least for now, you can go back and check. I grant everybody, I really mean this, I grant everybody, regardless if you're a crazy lefty progressive or you're a far right maniac, I grant everybody during those first two weeks of COVID, we were all so nuts, and maybe that was by design, okay? I'm not even defending wh whether we all should have been saner or not. But for those first two weeks when it was just, hey, two weeks, shut it down, social distance, wear a mask, we all kind of did it. Everyone did it. And I think you got to grant everybody a long leash. We were, we were shell-shocked in this crazy thing. Now, maybe it was all made up to some degree and it was a media, a media, con um, it was made up, just the whole thing, all right? Like a conspiracy, okay, fine, whatever, whatever it was. Um, but I grant everybody a long leash on that. And then it was very obvious to me. And as I said, since my videos are all online, you can go back and check. Like after two weeks, I pretty much was done. I pretty much was done. I was fighting for freedom. The idea that you can wear a mask if you want to wear a mask, but we shouldn't be locking things down. I knew once everyone started saying, once the meme came out and everyone online and in the media kept saying, this is the new normal and the way they liked it. And every article was, I'm never going to shake hands again. And I'm never going to go in a room again and I'll school at home forever. And but it was just obvious to me that you could get people to do all sorts of things. And then of course it got worse and worse and worse because you could get people to spy on their neighbors. You could demand people inject themselves with things. The same people who said my body, my choice right before and are saying it again now, all of that stuff. So the reason I'm talking about this clip is it's interesting because I don't remember Bill Maher on his show until the last say two or three months. There was a clip about three months ago, if I'm not mistaken, where Bill Maher talked about that there shouldn't have been these lockdowns and vaccine mandates, et cetera. So the point is that Democrats and liberals, they get everything wrong, all of the policies wrong. And then when it, when it bashes you in the face that your cities are burning down and you've ruined all the businesses and, and the kids are getting stupider and can't talk, then finally they go, oh, maybe we were kind of right. But they never apologized to the conservatives uh, who were getting it right the entire time. They're still a bunch of racist buffoons. So anyway, that's the theme today, that we have to really start recognizing that some people do get some stuff right. And it, lately, at least in the last couple of years, it's kind of been the, let's say, conservative libertarian crew. And then there's this sliver of liberals who get things right way late but they, they need to do some sort of mea culpa uh, and realize that maybe they ushered in some of this nonsense, right? Like, so again, I, I don't mean this to attack Bill, but a guy like Bill who is for big government, he lives in California, uh, he likes high taxes and government programs, but then when the government comes in and does the PPE programs, he talks about how inefficient it is and how people were stealing the money and a whole bunch more. So that is the general theme today.
Uh, let me talk to you real quick, guys, about Bonner Private Wine. You know, you've heard me talk about the amazing extreme altitude wines from the Bonner Private Wine Partnership before. I just had a bottle of their 9,000-foot Malbec the other night at dinner. It's grilling season, and the flavors are great with any meat you're going to have. They're unlike any wine you've ever tasted. It really is true. Blackberry, leather, smoke, and a little dark cherry. These wines are almost impossible to get on your own because the producers are deep in the Andes Mountains, and they make a very limited quality, uh, quantity. Today, I have an amazing offer that I've never had before. If you visit bonnerprivatewines.com slash Dave, you'll not only get wine for over 50% off plus free shipping, but you'll also get a bonus bottle of small batch limited production wine from their exclusive wine cellar. That's four bottles for the price of three. It's a deal that's too hard to turn down if you're a wine lover like me. Just visit bonnerprivatewines.com slash Dave to claim your bonus bottle and become part of America's most unique wine club. Okay, so... What is the theme once again today? The theme is that there is a series of people who get most things wrong. Whether it's COVID policy, whether it's crime policy, whether there's immigration policy, and then we see the, the fruits of getting these policies wrong, and then they suddenly seem like the good guys when they realize that everything that they've been ushering in is bad. But we need to stop playing that game. Otherwise, what does that do? That keeps us on that endless descent to hell that I'm always talking about. So let's talk a little, a little bit about crime because crime across America, but especially in blue cities and blue states, is going through the roof right now. And you know it's going through the roof when even on CNN, they can't deny it. Here's CNN's John Avalon uh, talking about the crime situation in Democrat-run cities. Robbery has jumped 19%. But the story in different cities, specifically in different neighborhoods, is all over the map. In Los Angeles, murders hit a 15-year high in the first six months of the year. In Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, shootings have spiked to record highs, climbing hundreds of lives. While 100 miles to the north, New York City has seen murders and shootings actually decline year over year. But robberies and assaults are up big time. Now remember, these are not just statistics. They are people's lives. Okay, so that is CNN admitting that something is going wrong in Democrat cities. Now, who's in charge of Democrat-run cities? Democrats, it's incredible. And uh, you may remember that we had about two years as the Democrats were burning down cities and you had to board up your store and say how much you love Black Lives Matter so that they wouldn't burn your store down. Uh, the Democrats were also uh, demonizing and defunding the police, something they say now that they didn't do, but we have video of them doing it. So we've been talking about defunding the police. Uh, there's some issues that we ask police to do, like mental health issues or policing in schools and all the rest, that perhaps we can uh, shuffle some of that money around. Suck it up. Defunding the police has to happen. We need to defund the police. Mayor Eric Garcetti saying, take some of the money from policing, about $150 million. I applaud Eric Garcetti for doing what he's done. Not only do we need to disinvest for in police, but we need to completely dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. So yes, defund your butts, defund you. Yes, I support the reallocation of resources uh, from NYPD. We will be moving funding from the NYPD to youth initiatives and social services. Yes, I support the defund movement. I think you do all those other things, you don't need all the money that's going to the police department. So yeah, I mean, the spirit of it, I, I, I do support that. Defunding police means defunding police. If these reports are accurate, then these proposed cuts to the NYPD budget are a disingenuous illusion. This is not a victory. The freshman Democrat adding the fight to defund policing will continue. Okay, so as you guys saw at the top of that clip, there are about six more minutes of that. Uh, but we only showed you about a minute of it. But those were officials in places like Minneapolis and places like San Francisco and L.A. And places like, what else was on there? Detroit, New York City. And they are all Democrat run. These were their own people who they voted in to say we would like less law and order. Then crime exploded. We'll get into that in just a second. Crime explodes all over. And then many of those very same people backtrack their words because there's a cause, right? The cause is defunding the police. And the effect is, oh, a lot of murder. So this is a problem. Uh, we've got a quote from the Council on Criminal Justice, uh, which will dive into a little bit of what's going on here related to crime. Uh, they put out a report. This report updates and supplements previous reports by the Council on Criminal Justice on recent U.S. crime trends with additional crime data through June of 2022. So this is very recent. 
the number of homicides declined by 2% in the first half of 2022 compared to the first half of 2021, a decrease of 54 homicides. Okay, that's pretty good. While this reduction is heartening, the homicide rate is still 39% higher than it was during the first half of 2019 before the COVID-19 pandemic. You see what's happening here related to defunding the police? Domestic violence incidences decreased by 5% between the first half of 2021 and the first half of 2022. This result is based on just 12 cities studied and should be viewed with caution. Residential burglaries were up 6%, non-residential burglaries were up 8%, larcenies were up 20%, and motor vehicle thefts up 15%, all increased in the first half of 2022 compared with the first, uh, the first six months of 2021. So you get it. Broadly speaking, all crime is going up. There are little incidences where things have gone down because we had the summer of love where violence and murder was running rampant like crazy. So there's a, if there's a slight 5% decrease in certain things, it's not something we should really be, uh, be you know, looking at and going, oh, this is just really spectacular. By the way, we haven't done this in a while. How many people were shot and murdered in Chicago this past weekend? Because we should be out there marching people. I, I don't know if you guys are busy for the rest of the day, I like to believe that you have enough work to be doing. How many people shot dead? Looks like, uh, oh, only six people were shot dead over the weekend. How many people were shot? I wanna know how many people were shot because you still it still counts if you're shot. 30 people shot, only six shot dead. So I guess that's probably a roughly average weekend for Chicago. But the point is, the point I'm trying to illustrate here is these things are not disconnected. When you, when you vote in people who say we will take back law enforcement, we will empower criminals, we will put more criminals on the street, we will not abide by law and order, well then you get the results of that. So for any of you who are watching this, who are, who are still Democrats or have friends or family who are still Democrats, it's like, where are the Democrats fighting against this? And yes, are there a couple? Does Bill Maher try to do it every now and again? Yes, but if you have no support in the machine, if you have no political support, no people out there leading the party who are, who are gonna say no more of this nonsense, then you're pretty much just yelling into a void. Uh, and speaking of people, and speaking of voting for people who support this nonsense, I'm gonna show you two Senate candidates running right now that are still going for all of this stuff. Before we get to that, let me talk to you about Moink Box real quick. You know, 60% of US pork production comes from one company owned by the Chinese, and their hogs are given something called ractopamine, which is banned in 160 countries, including China, yet you find it in your grocery aisle every day. There's a better way, and I wanna tell you about Moink. That's moo plus oink. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink menu tastes like it should because the family farm does it better. The Moink difference is a difference you can taste, and you can feel good knowing you're helping family farms stay financially independent as well. You choose the meat delivered in every box, like ribeyes to chicken breasts to pork chops, pork chops to salmon fillets, and much more. Plus, you can cancel any time. My personal favorite is their filet mignon, which I've served to the good people in this room right now. Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary called Moink's bacon the best bacon he's ever tasted, and Ring Doorbell founder Jamie Siminoff jumped at the chance to invest in Moink. Plus, they'll guarantee you'll say, oink, oink, I'm just so happy I got moinked. Phoenix likes when I read that. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash Ruben right now, and listeners to this show get a free filet mignon in every order for a year. That's one of the year's uh, one of the best filet mignons you'll ever taste. It's M-O-I-N-K box.com slash Ruben, moinkbox.com slash Ruben. Okay, so you might be watching this program and going, okay, Dave, I get it. Uh, we shouldn't be putting people back out on the streets who are violent criminals. We should be funding the police and making sure they have the resources to keep their cities safe. Actually, when we were showing you that little clip of all the Democrats defunding the police. Uh, there's that great moment where George Stephanopoulos uh, references Eric Arcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles, and says he cut 150 million from the police budget and Kamal Harris is like, yeah, that's great, that's great. I used to live in LA, it was a crime infested crap hole. Uh, the suburb of Miami I'm in right now uh, has not had a home break-in in 12 years. That's the difference when you care about law and order and you fund the people who are taking care of you versus when you defund and all that good stuff. Okay, the point is there are Democrats right now 
it's not just AOC a couple of years ago. It's not just Ilhan Omar. It's not just these clowns, Gretchen Whitmer, et cetera, et cetera. There are Democrats running right now who are running on the idea still of defunding the police, still of putting more criminals out in the street and much more. So now here's John Fetterman or Fetterwoman as he calls himself. Again, he is the, the Democrat running for Senate in Pennsylvania against Dr. Oz. And he wants to put inmates back out on the street because that's what people care most about right now. We have a catastrophic bottleneck in our prisons of over 5,000 men and women condemned to die in prison. And many of them, I believe personally, are deserving of a second chance. If you had a magic wand and you could wave it and fix one thing, what would it be? Life without parole in Pennsylvania. We could save billions in revenue long term. We could save thousands of, of lives and, and not make anyone less safe. And also expunge as many permanent records of people that have been living their best lives and have been paying well beyond when they should have for a charge that they caught you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Okay, because you guys know I'm fair and I like giving the devil his due. First off, I will say that there are probably ways that we could look at the prison system and prison reform and figure out ways to get some people back out on the street who are nonviolent offenders, maybe drug offenders, have been there for a long time or of a certain age, et cetera, et cetera. There are some things we can do about that. By the way, there was a guy, who was that guy? He was president with the crazy hair a couple years ago, Trump, who, thank you, Connor put it, <laughs> that's good. They put it on the uh, teleprompter for me. Um, Trump, yeah, Trump did prison reform and nobody really gave him any credit for that. If you want more on that, you can watch my interview uh, from earlier in the week and last week with Jared Kushner. Anyway, uh, Fetterman, I'll give him credit partly, right? So you got some of that. Okay, you wanna get these people out. What's interesting though, is the focus on that. In that Fox interview, which was the second part of what we just showed you, the interview is saying, what's one thing that you're really focused on right now? He could have answered anything. Well, you know, we do have crazy crime, and right? He's in running in, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia is a nightmare right now. Uh, he could talk about all the businesses that were destroyed. Their focus on these things is what the problem is, right? This guy, if you had a magic wand, what would you do, man? And his focus is, well, I'd like to just get more criminals out on the street. This is a problem, but it's also consistent. And it's consistent with a bunch of people that don't seemingly realize that they're the ones who have caused their cities to crumble. Here is Wisconsin Senate Democrat candidate, candidate Mandela Barnes. He's running for Senate in Wisconsin right now, and he'd like to empty the prisons too. Education, immigration reform, and treatment instead of prisons. Uh, which has been in the news a lot lately because we spend a billion and a half dollars each year to teach more prisons in Wisconsin. Uh, which is very important because we can cut our population in half, we can make our community safer, and we can. He'd like to cut the prison population in half. Let's just dump out half of the uh, inmates and see what happens. These are things that they want to do. It sounds crazy, right? It sounds absolutely nuts. And I think he said it'll make us safer. That sounds about right. Um, but they keep pushing this and for some reason their base loves it. Actually, their base seems to think it's sexy. So I'm happy that we're all here. I'm happy that we're all talking about it. Now that uh, criminal justice reform and reducing prison populations is now sexy. It's now a thing that leading candidates are talking about because 10 years ago, people would have ran away from this issue. People would have not come up and people would not have shown up to a forum like this because they would have been scared. They would look like they were soft on crime. It's sexy, man. I've never been more turned on than when a bunch of rapists get released <laughs> into the general population. It's so nuts. It's not just backwards, right? It's not just incompetence because they have to see that cause and effect that I talked about before. But it's not just crime, right? It's not just crime, it's, it's quite literally every single topic. So what else happens with these people when it comes to immigration, right? When Trump wanted to build a wall or when any Republican comes in and says, hey, we, we have to be a nation of laws, we have to have a border, let's say, and that we are a nation of immigrants, but you have to come here illegally and we have to have a process that makes sense. We have to figure out what do you do with all the people who are already here illegally, et cetera, et cetera. They're called racist and bigoted and xenophobic and everything else. Right now we have this insanely porous uh, border, thanks to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And even now, even now, we're gonna go back to this uh, Senate candidate in Wisconsin. 
as if he doesn't realize what allowing all these illegal immigrants into the country has done. Uh, well, he wants to give them driver's licenses, in-state tuition, and more. We need an immigration system that treats all people with dignity and with respect. A system that says that no human being is illegal. And in our states, we can start by making sure that immigrants have access to driver's licenses and in-state college tuition because they too are a part of our community. But Congress must act to create a path for citizenship instead of doubling down on a militarized border wall. See, you see why I showed this clip? I don't, I don't really care about this guy. I don't know a tremendous amount about the Senate uh, race in Wisconsin, okay? I don't, I'll be totally honest. But you see what he did there? He talks about it in the context of dignity, dignity and respect. Everyone should have dignity and respect. And then he, of course, he says the line, that's complete nonsense, but they love this line, no person is illegal. Except that's not true. If you are a Mexican citizen, let's say, or let's say you are a Nigerian citizen and you somehow get to Mexico and then you illegally come through our southern border and then you are in America, or even let's say you're a Canadian refugee who has good reason to flee Justin Trudeau and you somehow illegally come through our northern border and you might be white even, and I'll say that because that way people won't call me racist, although they'll do it anyway. You are illegally here. By definition, you are breaking the law. And if we do not deal with that within the legal system, then we, we simply don't have a country. It's just how it is. So the, this has very serious consequences. Their language and their rhetoric doesn't match up with reality. Everyone has dignity. Nobody's illegal. Okay, it just doesn't mean anything. It simply doesn't mean anything. So you get all these people we want, they don't, say they, don't, they don't say they want open borders, but everyone can kind of come, no one's illegal. Well, guess what? Bad things end up happening. We've got some info on what's going on uh, at our border. This is from the New York Post on June 22nd. The U.S. recorded more stops along the Mexico border fence so far in fiscal 2022 than in any accounting year in the 20-year history of the Department of Homeland Security with three months still to go. In all, 207,416 migrant encounters were recorded in June according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection, for a total of over 1.7 million stops along the southern border since October 1st, the most the agency has recorded for any fiscal year since 1960. And the number of migrant encounters along the southern border hit that mark despite dropping 14% in June from May's record high, according to data released by the Biden administration Friday. Nationwide border officials have encountered more than 2 million migrants since October 1st, 2021. Prior to last month, the highest number of migrants encountered in a fiscal year was 1.7 million uh, in 2021. Before that, the highest was 1.6 in year 2000. So what's interesting about this is when our administration basically says, hey, we're not going to really protect the border, people start pouring in. Then when people start pouring in, what happens? Well, in a place like a border town of Texas, a far right Latina, some all right, Latina. Uh, Myra Flores wins what was a Democrat seat for 100 years because people have had it and people want legal immigration, not illegal immigration. And then what happens? Well, finally, when enough people realize that people are pouring through the border, that no one is in charge of this, uh, suddenly the media, two years too late, again, that's the theme, that the media always, the media and the quote unquote sane Dems, they always catch up way too late. Then they start asking questions. Here's NBC's Chuck Todd asking Kamala about the border. This is just a day or two ago. Would you call the border secure? I think that there is no question that we have to do what the president and I asked Congress to do. Is the first request we made, pass a bill to create a pathway to citizenship. The border is secure, but we also have a broken immigration system, in particular over the last four years before we came in and it needs to be fixed. We're gonna have two million people cross this border for the first time ever. You're confident this border's secure? We have a secure border in that that is a priority for any nation, including ours and our administration. She is so extraordinarily vapid. Like, that's the only thing you could say about her, right? It's like, man, between her and Biden, it's like Biden doesn't know what she, he's saying and will just read anything. With her, it's as if they put her out there having no knowledge of anything. And she strings together words in the most circular way to say absolutely 
Nothing. Chuck is doing the best job he could there. Hey, uh, lady, you know, two million people are coming in. That's an awful lot of people. Uh, you, this thing's secure. And then she just says, well, we have a policy of a policy and it's a policy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so again, the cause and effect situation here is in full effect. Bad policies lead to crazy things happening and then crazy things actually then reverberate. When a crazy thing happens at the federal level, it may start in a border town of Texas, but then it reverberates throughout the nation. So this video is absolutely spectacular. This happened a couple days ago. If you did not see it, it's just so wonderful. So you guys know what's going on. The Biden administration basically is not taking care of the border. As Chuck said, about 2 million people are gonna run through this year. Then what happens? In Texas and in Florida, because we have sane functioning governors, our governors are now busing illegal immigrants to Washington, D.C., which is a wonderful plan. They don't have to stay here. And if we don't want them here, that is the policy of these states. And fortunately, we have states' rights, and we're going to send them to D.C. Now, D.C., Muriel Bowser is the mayor of D.C., and they've got a whole bunch of council people over there who want it to be a sanctuary city, and nobody's illegal. It's all of the stuff that sounds sort of right, but then in a functional way does not work. So we covered it, I think, a week or two ago, that in D.C., all of their homeless shelters are now being filled up with illegals. So this video came out. This is DC Councilwoman Brienne Nadu, and she is very upset because now DC is being overrun by the by the very people that she wanted to come into the country as long as they were going to stay in Texas. So it's been said, but it's worth reiterating that the governors of Texas and Arizona have created this crisis. And the federal government has not stepped up to assist the District of Columbia. So we, um, along with our regional partners, will do what we've always done. We'll rise to the occasion. And we've learned from border towns like El Paso and Brownsville. Um, and in many ways, the governors of Texas and Arizona have turned us into a border town. We don't know how long this will take to resolve, we don't know how long they will continue busing. And so the right thing to do here is to be prepared to ensure we can greet every bus, we can get people off on the right foot, we can get them where they want to go, and that will ultimately help them in their I mean, liberal logic, it basically makes people stupid. This woman, okay, so first off, she's saying it's it's the governors of Texas and Arizona that are doing this. Now, of course, as you know, but she's somewhat dim, uh, the federal government is in charge of our borders. So she may not be happy that the governors of Texas and Arizona and Florida are busing people to DC, but it's not their fault in the first place. The fault lies with the people that are in charge of the border. That's her party, right? That's old Joe and confused Kamala. So that's number one. Then she says something that really shows you what these people are. Now she's very upset. And why is she upset? Because DC is becoming a border town. But what do you mean? A border town would be full of immigrants and you'd think it would be very uh, diverse, very pluralistic, and everybody would be having a great time and there'd be no crime. What, what's the matter with border towns? Or is for some reason she's okay with border towns as long as they're in Texas and Arizona but not in DC. And then at the end, of course, she says, but we'll do what we do, which is rise to the uh, rise to it, and we will get to it, and we're gonna take care of these people. We will rise to the moment. And what she means by that is we are going to take more tax money from legal people, and we are gonna fund it into programs that will do absolutely nothing, keep a certain set of people here illegally. We're gonna keep them in the welfare state. It's gonna increase crime, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I say have at it, DC, enjoy. Um, <laughs> Speaking of ridiculous people, here's Lori Lightfoot. And in Lori Lightfoot's case, what did she say? Well, you know, uh, she's upset too that they're busing them over to her. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot said that migrants are being placed on buses with a lack of dignity to an unknown destination with very little food, very little water. Uh, she, of course, is the same Lori Lightfoot who, uh, as Daphne pointed out, six people killed in Chicago this weekend. Not a lot of dignity there, 30 people shot. Uh, she also wants Chicago to be a sanctuary city. So if you're saying, hey, we're a sanctuary city, we take care of everybody. Again, it sounds good, don't work. Well, then you're going to get all of this. So what is the point of everything I'm saying? They're fouling up. 
they push their stupid rhetoric. And no matter how many times it is proven wrong and, and quite literally dangerous, these people still get people to vote for them. And then they feel the terrible consequences of all of that. And then of course they run for higher and higher office. But now let's link this to the media too, because it's not just politicians who do all of the wrong things and then get better gigs, right? Get move all the way up. Uh, CNN's Brian Stelter. Well, I should say Brian Stelter, formerly of CNN, uh, as you know, one of the things that happened in August was he got fired. Now, I don't take great joy in someone losing their job, but he was in complete dereliction of his duty. This was not someone who deserved to be the host of a show called Reliable Sources, which was supposed to hold the media to account. I th I've mentioned this a few times before. I used to watch the show as a kid. I remember on Sunday mornings, I would watch the show. I really enjoyed it, even as a kid. I guess I'm doing the right thing for a living because it was about how the media should cover stories, how the media should frame things. Then Stelter made it what everything else is, which is just sort of a Democrat lie laundering machine. Well, here is Stelter. This is about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, in the height of all the lunacy, when he was defending uh, defund the police. But look, to be clear, this is a police-free zone, mostly police-free. Some police have come in. It amounts to about six blocks. Look at this map. Okay, it looks pretty big if you show the map, right, really zoomed in. But when you zoom way out, you see this is just a small part of Seattle. Now, here's what Fox News did on the web. Uh, we can go, let's zoom the map out. Let's just go ahead and show the, the zoomed out map if we can. I just want to make the point this is a small part of a big city, and that's not being reflected in the coverage. Okay, so why am I showing you this? What he's trying to do, what he was trying to do then is, ah, see, Fox is making it sound like crime is running rampant there, but there's really just a small area in Seattle and there isn't crime running rampant, even though cops can't go there. And yes, some couple people got raped and murdered or whatever, but ah, he's just obfuscating what the obvious truth was, which is that you can't have a, just a police-free zone. You can't have little uh, Bantha states within cities and all of those things. Actually, Connor over here used to live, he pointed out on the map, you live two blocks away from Choppy. You could point to it on that thing. How was it over there? Terrible. Terrible. It was not good, okay? That's the point. It was not good there. But now why am I talking about this? Because Stelter, with his idiotic rhetoric, to, the implication being that the people at Fox News somehow hate black people or poor people or aren't for Black Lives Matters or whatever. He got it obviously completely wrong and it was a disaster and Seattle uh, will take probably decades to get out of the crap that they're in because of all this. So what happens to Seltzer? Well, he gets fired and then he gets fired, but Democrat, so what happens? You fail up. From OutKick, former CNN host Brian Stelter has a new job. He has joined Harvard to warn students of threats against democracy. I think he's just going to stand in front of the uh, in front of the kids, big fat guy, big fat man shirt, and just write me on it. In threats to democracy. But you fail. I mean, really think about that. You get fired from CNN, the most beclownish news network in the history of all time, and then what happens? You get fired in disgrace, like actually in disgrace because you're so bad at your job. And then you get a gig at Harvard. Like you didn't get a gig at Nassau Community College. No offense, I'm from Long Island. It was just the one that popped into my head. I knew a lot of people that went there. He got a gig at what is thought of as the best Ivy League school in the United States, which is systemically racist against Asians. You guys know all about that. But they fail up. That is the point, much like the politicians. And speaking of failing up, uh, you may remember a woman by the name of Jen Psaki. We haven't talked about her in a while. Uh, well, she worked for the elderly man pretending to be President Joe Biden. And uh, old Joe also was all about defunding the police. Uh, surplus military equipment for law enforcement. They don't need that. The last thing you need is an up-armored Humvee coming into a neighborhood. It's like the military invading. They don't know anybody. They become the enemy. They're supposed to be protecting these people. So my generic point is but that- do we agree that we can redirect some of the funding? Yes, uh, absolutely. Okay, so that was Joe Biden a couple of years back. He wanted to redirect funding. He wanted to make sure police didn't have all the resources they need. Again, we can discuss whether they should have certain things or not. It's a separate idea, but he's the head. 
He's the titular head of the party. I think that's what they say, the titular head. And uh, he, I like how he said, I'm making my generic point. Everything you do is generic, you fool. Uh, anyway, but he was for defunding the police. Uh, and now how do I link this to failing up? Well, uh, you may remember Jen Psaki. And uh, of course, she was a professional liar. She always lied about everything. And one of the things she was always lying about was whether the administration and Biden were really for defunding the police or not made available. Thank you. And on the rise in violent crime, uh, compared to this time last year, homicides up 113 percent in Minneapolis, up 38 percent in Philly, up 22 percent in Chicago. Uh, just to clarify, the White House's position on this is that that is mostly because of guns? Well, first, I'm not sure what data you're looking at, but I think what we can, most data that is out there shows that there's actually been a rise in crime over the course of the last year, since the start of the pandemic, which actually predates President Biden taking office, to be but totally clear. Right now, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, Peter, and that's why we're, we are focused, well, we're focused on uh, solutions here, and that's why we proposed uh, putting a five, we put $5 billion in the American Jobs Plan to help address community violent intervention programs, to help fund them. That's also why we fought for funding for state and local governments in the rescue plan, something uh, many, uh, opposed. There was a lot of Republican opposition to that. St. Louis says that she believes more police does not prevent crime. Does President Biden agree with that? The president believes there's a number of steps that need to be taken to rebuild trust in communities. Police reform is long outdated. He also believes that there needs to be funding for local programs and local initiatives. And there's not going to be a shortage of funding uh, under our watch. Sorry, I showed her. I forgot what that was like. The point is, she's just saying a whole bunch of nothing, but in essence, they were for defunding the police. Then at the end, it's like, oh, we throw a bunch of money at stuff and we'll move money over here and over there and blah, blah, blah. But I think we can all agree that she was pretty terrible at her job. So what happens in the world of Democrat media politics and the constant blowjob that that thing is? Well, Jen Psaki yesterday on the Twitter, first day, new job. Thrilled and honored to be here with this remarkable team. See you soon on TV. And that is her NBC Universal Pass, Jennifer Sahi. And yes, it seems that she will be getting a show on MSNBC. So you are a horrible, a horrible bounty hunter. You are a paid liar for an administration, a woman who could not say anything true, who I often said her head was like this because the truth wants to come out of you and she was trying to lock it in. What happens? Much like Brian Stelter, you get fired, you get a gig at Harvard, you, you step down really in, you should be ashamed of yourself for what you did for a year and you get a job at a corporate news network. Uh, so uh, as Saki would say, to circle back to where we started, the Democrats are basically getting everything wrong and we cannot forget that they get everything wrong and seemingly don't seemingly don't learn their lessons along the way. Uh, so let's go back to sort of where we started today. Uh, CNN, John Avlon, uh, basically telling, to Democrat, telling Democrats there's a problem here. When the state legislature finally acted on criminal justice this summer, they decided to focus on semantics instead of solutions, officially replacing the term inmate with incarcerated person in state laws. Seriously, that's what they did. Now, sometimes, we forget that public safety is a fundamental civil right. And it's often lower income neighborhoods that suffer the most from high crime, while wealthier neighborhoods stay relatively safe. In fact, black and Hispanic Democrats are more likely than white Democrats to support increased spending on local police. That's according to a Pew survey from late last year. Look, politicizing crime seeks to gain from other people's pain. But trying to ignore crime for ideological reasons is both callous and clueless. And it's sure to promote a political backlash. Look at me. I want to pat myself on the back. Showing CNN doing something sane. And isn't that something that, that the black and Hispanic community, I hate that phrase, uh, that in this at least one Pew poll that they're referencing there, that they want more local policing than the white people. I mean, it's just so perfect. But if a black person was to say that to a white liberal, they would call them a self-hating black person. I mean, it's just so bananas. So what do you do? What is the solution, ladles and jelly spoons? You must make a decision. If you are a Democrat or a friend of a Democrat, we're arming you with information here. We're arming you with arguments and information. We all know these people who are still bamboozled, who are still trying to break out of their factory settings, uh, but they can be gotten to. I really believe it. There's not many people who can move one way or another who are gonna potentially vote in a different way this November than they would have in the past. But I think the Democrats who are not completely 
mind melted at this point are the ones that we can get to. Uh, and one of them is Tulsi Gabbard. We need a unifying president, someone who will bring our country together. And unfortunately, what we're seeing from President Biden and his administration is the exact opposite. They are pouring fuel on the flames of divisiveness. They are attacking and targeting anyone who dared to vote against President Biden or anyone who dares to disagree with his views, demonizing them and and frankly portraying them as extremists who pose a, a very direct threat uh, to our country. It's clear that through his speech, through his actions and policies, he cares more about power than he does about the freedom and well-being of the American people. And I mean, I've said it a bajillion times, but just imagine what a different situation we might be in if the Democrats, when they cut all the backdoor deals, had gone with Tulsi as VP instead of Kamala Harris. Imagine what a moderating effect that might have had. And when they put the, that woman out, a, an active member of our military who's a proud American, who is more lefty than I am, uh, imagine how different that would be than when they put out Kamala, who has no idea what she's saying. I mean, it would be so fundamentally different. That would have been the chance, but the point is they always miss their chance. And do you know why? Because they've become the party of no common sense. But who said that? It wasn't me. Oh, that was Bill Maher just a day or two ago. I think they're going to get thumped in the election. I mean, that usually happens in midterm elections. But, you know, I mean, Joe, look, I'm glad he's there, but uh, he has not exactly stuck the landing on a lot of the issues that he was dealing with. I keep saying this to the Democratic Party. The reason why you are so toxic is because you have become the party of no common sense. Well, well, what do you mean you're glad he's there? What do you mean you're glad Joe Biden's there? Are you glad that we left Afghanistan the way that we did? Are you glad that the deficit is through the roof? Are you glad that the supply chain ain't working? Are you glad that gas prices were through the roof now they're coming down a little bit, so the administration is going, see, gas prices are coming down, but it's like, uh, they're still higher than when you got there, okay, fine. That so many things are a problem, but you're glad he's there, meaning you're glad Orange Man isn't there. And, and that's what I'm gonna hopefully work on a little bit uh, with Bill Maher. But yes, the Democrats are no longer the party of common sense. Perhaps they never were, but there is nothing commonsensical about the Democrats anymore, which is why I always say, you don't have to be a Republican, but you cannot be a Democrat. These people all have to go. And, and if that means that the radical base, that the progressive woke lunatics and the genderless wackadoodles and all of that stuff, that they fully take over that party, well then so be it because they've taken it over already. And, and some of the people who are the quasi moderates, they're just making it seem like it's not as bad as it is, but it is. And the funny thing is, and, and Bill, if you're watching this, and I'll hopefully get to say it to you next week, you could look at my life as an example of what could happen. You can be invited to all of the Republican and Libertarian and right-leaning events that I go to, and you, Bill Maher, the, the biggest liberal atheist in the country, could probably get the invite to Liberty University. You could speak at all of the conservative college events that I go to. You could tell them that you have disagreements with them as I do, and you'd be applauded for it. And then what you might be able to do, Bill Maher or Tulsi Gabbard or anyone else that's in this space, you might actually be able to moderate the conservatives a little bit. You might be able to carve out a little place of common sense on the Republican side. And I bet you, you could. I will bet, I, do I have $5 here? I will bet you five American dollars that if Tulsi or Bill Maher or any one of these, you know, quote unquote, sane liberals, that if they would just start going to the Republicans a little bit more, going to the conservatives, talking at their events, they will find nothing but goodness. And it does not mean that they're betraying what they believe. It doesn't mean that they're gonna get everything they want, but it will be a hell of a lot better than the scorched earth and the endless descent to hell that they're on right now. That's how I feel about that. Uh, we got a cold close for you in just a moment. Let me get to a couple comments at rubenreport.locals.com. Uh, Chris says, isn't that the platform that Bain ran his campaign on in Dark Knight Rises? Bain did run an interesting campaign. You know, you can't leave nothing for everybody else. And uh, we're going to have to take down everybody in Wall Street. 
Good movie, Crow. Man, I miss those trilogy. By the way, the new Batman, which I saw a couple weeks ago, was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Tony says Bill Maher can bloviate all he wants and point out problems, but if he if, if, but if he refuses to get behind the solution, he's no help. Well, look, that's what I that's what I want to talk to him about. It's like if you get there, if you get there, then what what is the last thing that you're afraid of? I, like, is it really that you think all of these people are religious whack jobs? They're not. They're not. And it might say something about religious people if all of the religious people are the ones defending the world that you want to live in. So I, hopefully we can have that conversation. A TA says even Fauci is trying to walk back that he never ordered lockdowns. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You know, it's, it's rats on a ship at this point. They are all going to reverse everything that they said. And that's what I mean about all of the people that they get there late. Fauci is like a particular, a particular example of evil because he was guiding so much of it. And the way he would, you know, if you criticize me, you're criticizing science. Like he's a very bad version of it. But we just can't forget all of the people that were joyously calling for lockdowns. The people, I mean, there were mainstream journalists and politicians who wanted people fired from their job if they did not get an injection. And they are the same people who right now related to abortion will be screaming, my body, my choice. We cannot forget these people and we must re remember it. We must remember it because guess what guys? Mark my words. Connor, can you put a little note in today's episode for Dave's words to be marked? It's going to happen again. Whether it is COVID-2 or it's monkeypox seven or they, it's a zombie apocalypse or a climate emergency or whatever, they will try all of this again. It may not look exactly the same, but the markers will be there the same because this was a test. You know that, that Jordan Peterson video I always show you guys when he's on Rogan talking about how do you encroach on people? You don't take everything at once, you push. You see what pushback there is. You push again, you see what pushback. And I think mo for the most part, the powers that be, they got us all to fold. They got us all to fold with little pockets of resistance. Guys, we happen to live in one of those little pockets of resistance, which is pretty sweet. So thank you, you lived a block away from CHOP. I saved your life, man. <laughs> you gotta you should thank me. I hope you wake up every morning going, thank God for Dave Rubin. On that note, guys, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, why don't you jump over to rumble.com slash Ruben Report and uh, watch us over there. Uh, and of course, we are always, always at rubenreport.locals.com. I've enjoyed the program today. Part one of Vivek Ramaswamy. Really interesting interview. This guy is a VC guy who is trying to figure out, is there a way to do true stakeholder capitalism where actually your interests will have a little something to do with where you put your money and that you're not just gonna fund your own demise by putting your money into these funds that are gonna push all this woke nonsense. Really interesting. Part one is up on uh, Rumble. They're up already, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, part one's up on Rumble and YouTube right now. The full thing's up over at Locals. And we have a cold close for you. It's Joe Biden struggling once again. Goodbye. God bless you all and may God protect our troops. Thank you for listening. Ambassador and Jack, come on back up. Thank you very much. Keep up the fight. Thank you. I'm going to walk.